I'm gonna stick this bad boy behind me. I fucking love this picture, dude. We are, I think we're live now. Sick. I think so. You guys let me know for good. He said it's like waiting in line, so I guess it was working. Oh, look at you all fancy. I guess I need some cool shit behind me now. <laughs> I love that picture, dude. Oh, yeah, I love that one, dude. I actually was looking dude. through his artwork. I want to get some shit made, bro. This shit is dope. Bro, I, I ordered like two small prints, like 13 by 18 small prints, right? Mm -hmm. And... uh I was a big fan of this one, and he ended up sending me this big ass one. Hell so cool, yeah. Man. yeah. That's sweet, dude. All right, so I think we're on now. Hell yeah. Welcome everybody back to the stream. We got uh, already like 25 people hopping on right now. We should have quite a few people on here today. But um, you guys should know Deal Grows by his handsome face. Positive energy. What up? <laughs> what is actually up? Just just commenting on all your positivity and uh, how no matter what you got going on in your personal life, you always make sure to spread some positivity to everybody every day. And uh, that's such an awesome attribute because there's so much negativity in this industry. Yeah, there's so much negativity. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I've had a, not the smoothest life, you know, and now just being, being 30 and raising my kids, you just gotta be positive and keep moving forward. So it's Hell always yeah. reminder for me. Yeah. And you're always paying it forward, always teaching people how to hash. So, uh, you know, I don't even bother teaching people my old ways anymore without equipment. Like I was telling everybody a few minutes ago, you know, it's been so long since I've done things without this equipment that there's probably better ways and methods than what I used to do before I had it because, you know, shit's changed. So I don't even, I don't even tell people anymore. I just, send them straight to your page, you know? And now that you're putting out those videos, oh man, it's so helpful. So everybody obviously wants to know from the no freeze dryer tech guru himself, you know, what's the method? What do you do from start to finish? What equipment do you need besides the freeze dryer and things like that? What's the budget equipment that you use to make it happen? Well, basically, I just kind of pretty much go in the timeline. Like when I first started doing it, um, I just started using paper plates and it was just basically parchment and uh, paper plates to dry the hash on. Um, as far as the washing goes, you know, I bought some cheap uh, bubble bags online. I think they're called magic bubble bags. And it was like a whole set, um, small five gallon set. And I just washed like anything I could ounces of like an ounce uh trim anything mm -hmm. i could could do small amounts i just washed a bunch of ice and in this shed this shed was just like a hot hot shed but now it's my dab lab or no no <laughs> my, my dab maker lab <laughs> that dab just got me a little bit but uh <laughs> i started the raw materials man paper plates parchment and then uh i noticed the whole paper plates because i used the paper plate and i kind of made a little like uh shell kind of for the hash inside and that kind of created a, like a dry environment so i thought oh i heard pizza boxes i'm like no brainer pizza boxes same kind of thing parchment though because i just saw i looked at the pizza box and there's little fibers and i saw on youtube a lot of people doing that i'm like nah i don't want the fibers in my hash so mm -hmm. i put on parchment same thing you do with paper plates and i put in pizza boxes and uh the coldest environment i could find was my fridge so I put it in my fridge. Um, I noticed when it was first wet in the fridge the next day, not much happened. So I would put it in the freezer. And then after pulling it out of the freezer, I seen like a nice layer was kind of like uh, dried. So I kind of scraped it off a little bit and then kind of broke it up a little bit, separated the dry from the frozen parts and put it in the fridge. And I check on it every now and then, and it would just kind of do that back and forth, play with it, watch it, and um, keep separating it. And then by the end, it'd be mostly kind of dry or dry enough to push it through a sieve. How long would that? How long would that process take? Like two days, four days? About like two to three days, and you could probably push it all through the sieve, and then it'd be dry enough. 
And then there's also a completely other tech too that I tried doing, and it's microplaning. And ugh, I think we've all done the old bubble man tech. What's a bubble man tech? The, the, like the yeah. yeah, the frozen patties. Exactly. Yeah, I didn't like it too much, so that's why I just kind of kept doing what I did. And uh, yeah, that's a microplane, and you freeze the patties, and you just to do the same kind of concepts. But in my head, I'm like, well. I don't want to shred anything. I don't want to disturb anything. And then my fingers get too warm. I got to play that game. So I'd rather play the game of just drawing it, washing it, separating it, and letting it kind of yeah. not forcing it. That's another thing. I'm not a big fan of forcing things. So that's that was my mindset behind it. But paper plates, pizza boxes, your your fridge and freezer inside your house, you know? So what's your tech now? You're not using, are you using the pizza boxes and the parchment and the fridge or what are you using now? Same basic concept, but uh, I came across a, uh, this beer fridge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so a beer fridge, I think you would find in like any liquor store, you know? I got lucky because uh, I worked in the trades, uh, the trades before this. I was an HVAC tech, and then became on my mission to get out of that world. You know, I had to step down from being a technician. I became a warehouse guy, and I met a lot of other technicians, a lot of other different people. You know, owners of companies, refrigeration, and etc. And uh, one of my customers had a whole garage full of these, and I snagged it up for like 150 bucks. And oh, yeah. I'm, like, I'm like, sweet. My wife's going to be happy. I can get all the pizza boxes out of the fridge, out of the house. And uh, that was the whole, my whole mentality was that too. Like I, I had to chase my goal, but I had to respect that balance of family and being a husband and being a father. So uh, mm -hmm. I grow slow, you know, pretty slow because yeah. of that, I guess. But it, it's for a reason, you know. But anyway, I got that bad boy and uh, fucking works amazing. You know, who would have known? I put in the uh, the clock humidity little bad boy thing, you know. It was like 10% humidity, 19 degrees, 10 Fuck degrees that. sometimes. So, yeah, and somebody said that's not a standard beer fridge. Beer so froster, it's a, maybe? It's a foggle beer chiller. Is that correct? Yeah, someone said someone's called it a beer froster chiller. Um, I've shown the model. You know, I don't know if I could flip this camera view around. Do it. Can I? I was hey, a camera. Nope, that's not it. I don't know if you guys can see in there, but I'll send it. Uh, yeah, I'll send the model. I'll get a picture to to you, and you could post it, or maybe my next video on YouTube too. I'll post it because I, I mean, you know, I think it's like I looked it up like eight hundred to maybe a thousand bucks. But you yeah, know, it's kind of expensive. It's yeah, it's half. <laughs> so you might, if you're gonna save to buy a beer fridge, you can, you know, and you know if you want to do it like that, buy a beer fridge, work on that, save money, buy a freeze dryer. If it used a beer fridge for beer, but if you're gonna buy that, you might as well buy a freeze dryer. Free, freeze dryer and learn that because this takes, you know, three sometimes five days, where this will take 24 hours, right? Right, right. But if you, it's like you said, if you can find one on the come up, you know, be resourceful, you know, and most people that are. You know, looking for your tech or trying to be resourceful. So if they're not willing to put in a little bit of search, you know, do some used Craigslist or whatever. You know, sometimes you just got to take that hit and use the used equipment for a while, right? For sure. And maybe, hate to say it, but maybe because the whole pandemic and thing, there might be some businesses going out. You know, they need to sell equipment like this, and now is a good time to come up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely absolutely. look out. So, so what, what would you say <clears throat> your tech level is at right now <laughs> as far as using 
a freeze dryer and not using a freeze dryer. Because right now I would say my my ability to use a freeze dryer and dial it in is <coughs> maybe like an eight or a nine out of a 10, right? But my ability to free like process it without the freeze dryer, probably like a fucking two. If I tried to fucking process some hash without the freeze dryer right now, honestly, it would probably come out shit, you know? So where do you feel you're at on both of those planes? Dude, I, I feel like this is the complete opposite of you. Like hundred <laughs> percent. I'm trying to work I'm trying to work this thing right here. It's giving me not too many problems, but like you see uh the fitting here. First the hose going straight into the machine. This machine hose fitting is like a water hose. And it, it leaked this needed a uh compression fitting, you know. So I had to order it. The first one I ordered was wrong. That one's good, it fits. But now I'm having this the software issues. But here's where it, like I don't know what to call it, like fate, destiny, but like it all comes together this way because the guy that I got this from is a solid dude. And he has given me his contacts and his contacts are solid guys. And uh, I got an email with the software waiting for me. I got to get the flash drive, plug it in, and hopefully reprogram the software. And uh, I'll be rocking and rolling, you know? But like right now, my skill level... Dude, I need my sweater. It's getting cold in here. My skill level is... Uh, <laughs> Not using a freeze dryer, I would say probably like eight or nine. You know, maybe I wouldn't say ten because you're always learning. You know, you're always growing and getting better. But maybe eight or nine, and then uh, using a freeze dryer like a one or two. Right now, <laughs> once it gets yeah. operating, I think I'll pick up pretty fast. But if you have problems with that anymore, let me know because I got into it with Harvest Right so many times that I'm now friends with the engineer who actually does like the, the back end engineering. He's not the service desk tech that you talk to on the phone. He's like the fucking man, you know? So if you need his email to get like everything set up and going, all you got to do is let me know. Solid. High five, yeah. brother. Thank you. That uh, Man, that shit is horrible. I hate that they have such horrible front end customer service because it's almost like they have a group of really smart engineers on the back end who are helpful. And then they hired like a third party um, call center to be their service desk. It's like, there's no real knowledge of the product with the people that answer the phone and they never follow through. <laughs> so that's tough. I think that's every industry kind of struggles with that struggles with that kind of hiring and passing the knowledge, like just coming from the HVAC industry, when I'd be in customers' houses, you know, they'd be like, oh, the lady on the phone said this and this and this. I'm like, oh, no, you know, it's totally different. And like, they don't know what we do, kind of. It's so it's something that every industry struggles with, but that's why I'm really big about like sharing information, you know, and sharing the knowledge. So we've got a couple of questions here. Um, somebody said, looks like you're using the fridge when you have the freeze dryer. What's your thought behind it? Is it because you're not comfortable with the freeze dryer settings? That's because he's having software issues right now, guys. So, the, what happens with the, the harvest rights specifically is that the hard drives that they use, um, the motherboards are flashed multiple times, right? And when you flash it and you just rewrite over it and over and over and over it, uh, eventually they just get corrupted. And so what will happen is you'll have a software update or it'll go to boot up and it'll just crash. And you basically have to completely reset the motherboard, the motherboard back to its original software version. And then they had me run a special firmware bootloader that like overrode the settings and like backdated the firmware. And then they had me re fucking update it. And then finally it works. And it was like a, a big pain in the fucking ass. And a lot of people are having these problems right out of the box. And Harvest right instead of fixing it or replacing it or what have you, they are 
forcing customers to do their own uh, repairs, their own fixes. And when you pay a couple thousand dollars for a, a, you know, a scientific machine, you expect it to come with a certain level of quality control and customer service. And right now they're lacking in both. And the only other competitor is charging like four or five times the price. Crazy. So, Whistler Tech. There's, seen those, I right? see, I've seen <clears throat> I've seen others, I think, too. Maybe two or three. I think there's like three out there, but I don't know all the names. Like Harvest Right, the one you're mentioning, and one more maybe. But it's mm. still super expensive. Yeah. And this these are Harvest Right are the smallest ones. All the other ones are like much larger. Like it would take up like twice the space almost, if not more. So they said you guys need to start your own freeze dryer business. I tried to with Sasquatch, but my programmer fell through, so we never went through with it. Um, so I have some questions now. When you're drying your hash with your process, what is your telltale sign that it's done? It's dry, it's ready to be pressed. And do you still do it in segments where, like let's say you have a tray of hash that's drying, do you still pull out pieces that are dry and leave the wet stuff? Or do you now have it down to where you can get the whole tray to dry at the same time so you pull it out together? Uh, I make sure it's all dry before I pull it out. And the way I do that, like there's no scientific way I do that. I just make sure it can go through the sieve very well without having any pieces kind of left behind that I have to force through. And then um, let's say... I, I'll do that. I'll put it all through, and it all falls through. I'll lay. I'll I'll sieve it out super thinly on parchment. Sometimes I have to do two trays, you know, to make it super thin, and then I'll leave it in there for one more day, a couple more hours, just to really make sure, you know. And uh, that's how I tell it's like completely dry. So as you're drying it, are you breaking it apart? Because I used to watch you do it with the knife where you would chop it every day so that it, it dries evenly and, you know, you don't get those chunks. Are you still doing that or what are you doing now? So I never really did that um, on my personal side. That was like more of my, my commercial experience I had with, uh, I don't want to say their name. I think they're out. I think they're done anyway. But yeah. I think they're done anyway. <laughs> Once I left, I think they just uh, kind of trickled away, but mm -hmm. not like <laughs> that place was funny, man. That experience was funny. That's another story too, probably. I I'll know. let them like really be gone. I don't want to like, uh, I don't want to put on anyone on blast, but yeah, I did to chop it up I, in that commercial, commercial setting. I had a big old bunch of hash. I actually squeezed the water out. That was his directions. I would never do that for myself, you know, but it was like, Machine ran commercialized material, you know. They ran it through trim, uh, trim machines, and I, I got the hash and like we made it in like giant, like a uh, uh, big old washing machine, like five washing machines connected together, and uh, the bubble machines, you know, but like the cheap ones, plastic yeah. ones. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, with me, so fuck. What was the question? Completely again. <laughs> like just, like, just like the very like. Just separating the hash, right? Like, okay, using a knife, I let it dry. I get it all as dry as I can in the bag, you know? I let it sit there. I shake it around, get the hash pretty dry. And I just use a spoon to separate it as thinly as I can. Um, so you don't want clumps on your parchment. And you're not scooping water in, so you're not getting puddles. So you're just using the spoon to break it apart. And it's at that point kind of like a wet sand. And then... You go ahead and you put it in the fridge. And then how does the hash react in your dry method over that 24 hours? Like when you go to check on it the next day, is it is it still clumpy? Is it harder? Does it, how does it change? So you can kind of see it like uh, the color change a little bit. Like, and let me just look right, right now, you know, because I just took out, see all this hash in here I haven't touched. And this came all... You probably won't be able to see through my camera through the camera. But all this hash here needs to be like moved around. And I need to separate the dry from the wet and the frozen and get a good separation and then leave it in there longer. And then I kind of keep on doing that and then I can incorporate the sieve 
after a day or two of doing that, you know, and you can see the color change a little bit. So because you're drying it in there and the temperature you said gets down to what, like 19, 20 degrees, right? Yeah, right now it's reading 26. But if I, I bet if I threw this in there, see what this would say. So with it only getting that cold and not getting as cold as a freeze dryer and going through, you know, the whole freeze dry process, do you still end up with actual frozen chunks of hash or are they just kind of cold, you know, like, are they hard frozen or? No, that's, that's they're never really hard, hard frozen. Um, if they're not soft enough or dry enough really to, to break up the spoon, um, Sometimes I'll throw that little hardened like chunk into the sieve to kind of knock around a little bit, and and I just keep, kind of just separate it, just keep spreading it out. I think the the key to this method is to have it to always like be on top of it, separating the dry from the wet, you know, and, and getting that surface area spread out. Um, is there any airflow in there? Yeah, there's a little fan. And I have it actually, it's not directly flowing on. I have a, a piece of parchment kind of magneted around, like around the fan and the fan's blowing like straight up, but there is a fan. So that helps the drying process, you know? Right. Because drawing, I, I, I did some air drying in that commercial setting I was talking about. They just did like the speed racks and all on parchment, squeezing out that water. Um, chopping it up, getting it nice and thin, um, as thin as you can, and letting it air dry. They had it in an uncontrolled environment. Like the room probably got to like 86 degrees. It was a pretty big sized room, but like 86 to 70, pretty much room temp, you know? But if you didn't spread it out thin, it, it does oxidize, which is the problem. People don't like that discoloration. And it gets super hard. So if you don't spread it thin, you're gonna have this like big hard chunk of dried hash that you don't really can't really do, you know. But if you spread it out thin, get it super dry. I don't recommend squeezing it, man, but getting it super dry, you know. And I don't like those micron screens either that guys use. It's the same thing. I don't like squeezing the hash unless you're in a super, super cold room. Maybe you can get away with doing that, but I wouldn't recommend it but separating um, it in that surface area, really. So what do you think about the tech, since you mentioned the micron screens, where people take the pressing micron um, screens and they put paper towels or cardboard or a towel underneath it to help dry it out? I've, uh, I've done that once just to test it, you know? I've tried it, and I just don't like I, I, I like it. I saw the water, the moisture, the hash escaping. You know, but then I just thought about the bottom part and the fibers touching the paper towel and, I don't know, getting contaminated. I didn't like the paper towel method. Using the micron screens, I just think it's messy, you know, and it just, it gets messy. Then you're going to get that hash off the micron screen. You're going to scrape it up and scrape it. Like, it's just messy. Yeah. So here's, have you seen the bolt, um, reusable tray screens right for the freeze dryer i see them not, not in person I, but i think puffin uses them i think i think, Josh I think uses uh them. green thumb uses them yeah he uses them too so think about how their hash kind of comes off there right because when when you're doing it in a freeze dryer and you remember they're doing their shit in the freeze dryer right so in the yeah. freeze dryer when it comes out of there it comes out already like like i don't know like a powder cake right like it's a patty it's like a cake it's formed but as soon as you go to touch it it just falls apart like fresh powder right like dry powder right so it kind of like just comes off of those micron screens pretty easily you know, I had a concern that you might leave maybe a gram of hash total in there. Like that would be a little bit difficult to get off, but it just depends on how cold it is in the room because it's already kind of come out of the freeze dryer super fucking cold. Like it's not going to want to stick to that shit, you know? Right. And that's also like why you have to pre-freeze the trays and everything in the freeze dryer before you start loading the hash onto it. So I was thinking my tech old school used to be using those pressing screens 
and I would scoop the patties out of the hash bags, right? Get it as dry as I can. And I would put it onto the 25 micron and I would use a chamois. Remember like, like an auto chamois? Yeah. They have no fibers. And if you buy new ones, you can put those down on whatever surface you want to use, cookie sheet, um, like a cookie drying rack because it has holes so it allows airflow, right? You put that down and then you put your pressing screens on that and scoop your patties onto that. And then just very, you know, it'll quickly absorb the moisture out, right? It's super quick. You don't have to press it or anything. And I would freeze it like that, like as is. And then I would microplane it. I was microplaning back then, you know, but that way I would get like a really dry patty with not a lot of moisture. So when I would go to microplaning, uh, microplane it, it was pretty easy, you know. And then um, from microplaning it, I would do the cardboard because I didn't know about the fibers at the time. So I would go with, um, cause I was just using the chamois because it dried better. I didn't think about the fibers, right? So I would put my shit on cardboard on top of the press screens to do the, stuff, the final drying, you know? And then um, I would just try and leave it in a really dark, cold room and have like a tiny bit of airflow. But I wasn't measuring even temperature, or humidity of the drying space back then. You know, how important is that, you know, to measure those things and be on top of it? So the chamois tech, though, I think there's something there with that. For people that don't have a freeze dryer and you want to be able to pull that excess moisture out of your hash before you do whatever whatever else you're going to do with it, you know. Buy a brand Without, new like, squeezing you with your hand, you know. I think the chamois yeah. tech is, is a, great, a great tool, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you spread out the hash on the surface of that 25 yeah. micron, don't just have it in a big clump, you know, spread right. it out and it'll pull that moisture out real quick. And then if you take that from there and, and go with whatever else tech you want to go with from deals or combine, you know, whatever text you're learning here, there's no one right answer. Like you said, right. Take what we're teaching you guys and combine it. However works best for you guys. Find out what, find out what works best for your situation. So yeah. yeah, chamois tech, man. Fucking. I'm thinking if I were to use like incorporate that chamois tech, I would probably use just what you're saying, the chamois, the the micron screen. You know, they they make 15 micron screens. If you get yeah. one of those. You can even buy sheets of this stuff too. You don't need to like go buy like buy from a company. You can buy like sheets of these screens um, and roll it out fat. <laughs> a big chamois, a big old sheet. Uh, start your clump on one end. And, and spread it out as thinly as you can, and then try to put that whole thing, maybe you know, somewhere to to finish drying. Yeah, dude, talk about <laughs> let's talk so about ways <clears throat> let's talk about the quality. Well, first off, does anybody have any questions about his tech before we move on to other stuff? And then I wanted I wanted to ask you about your experience working with other farmers um, because I know that right now you're trying to get your um, growing part started, you know, and right now you're focusing on just processing. So what's your experience working with other farmers, um, you know, from the good to the bad? It's been, it's been great. It's experience like anything else, you know, being in different farm settings and like, each grower is different as well. They all do different stuff. And it's very, they're all very contradicting each other, you know? But um, it's nice to go in, help them, um, get kind of paid for experience on, on that. And then just constantly thinking like what I would do if it was me growing. And because I'm growing for like the resin and like hash. And like, I'm just constantly asking questions and just, trying to be a sponge you know in, in every setting you know and yeah. sometimes shitty situations we're doing shitty work um for maybe some shitty farmers but it's just all learning experiences you know and yeah. uh hmm. i mean that's so, pretty much all i can say i'm pretty blessed to, to have found these guys too so if you think back on your time working with other farmers What's one memorable experience that you've had where you were just like kind of shook? Like I'll, I'll share mine so you kind of get an example. 
So for me, I had a person tell me how fire this shit was that they wanted me to run. Right. I told him exactly what to do, how to, you know, get it ready for me, how to bring it to me. Right. They sent me pictures, stuff looked great. So I'm like, cool, let's do it. Right. They show up with a cooler with no ice, with bags of weed that they had frozen in their refrigerator freezer in the house, not a chest freezer. Okay. Which at this point had now thought out it was fresh frozen too it wasn't dried material so fresh frozen material that thawed out in a warm cooler on the drive to me and they brought me like majority of what they brought me was shit that we didn't even discuss prior to them coming it was <laughs> extra shit that they were just like oh yeah and i had this and i just you know i thought maybe you could run it and see what you could do with it and if you can't do anything with it just throw it away Man. That, bro, I can't even fucking start right now on that. That'll be a twenty-minute rant. So that's my that's my example. You ever had anything like that? I feel like I feel like I have. You know, uh, maybe not as bad as like them freezing it and bringing it to me all all wet and warm. That's pretty <laughs> bad. Like, what are they expecting after that? But like, I've had people give me trim, you know, and and after I ran it. After you know, I'm like, oh, cool, I do it. I'm like, you know, it yielded, but it's all it's kind of like really a dark brown, like a hash. I pressed it, it, came out pretty black, you know. Like, I'm sorry, you know, I felt you know, like, oh, I felt bad, but he's like, oh, okay, no worries, man. That was like a year and a half ago, no big deal. I got some more if you want to try. I'm like, never ever want to try. I would never, never do it ever again, you <laughs> know. It just led to someone else, like. You know, that's what I learned. Okay, age matters, you know. I get I mean, but it's all all learning experience, you know. Um, Look how he's so positive. I'm like, give me your worst experience. And he's like, it's all a learning experience. Dude, <laughs> they're, they're all bad. They're all, I've had a lot of bad ones, man. They're all kind of bad. Oh, I, I guess I mean, fuck, dude. Like, real bad. Like, real, honestly, the, the, some of the worst was actually in the commercial fucking legalized, like, setting, dog. Like, Oh, the I shit that I've got. It. I'm like, wow. It would it would come uh like dust, like uh look like literally literally like uh just like the old Mexican weed like just smashed. Like I find the bottom of the bag like just smashed with, with stems and like the stems that are just like all fibered out, you know, because like they ripped them off or something like that. And just super dirty. And this is like in a license setting, guys. Like, oh my god! I know you're preaching. Like, uh, I think it was you. Like, know your grower. Like yes. that—that's huge. That's like what really pushed me. I was a huge dispensary head. Went to all dispensaries, chasing that quality, you know. But uh, there's nothing like pretty much the home growers, you know. And, and again, not every home grower is good. So, but yeah, you can't you can't you can't trust that license stuff, man. And then they, they most of that time because that a bag like that would go to BHO. And I told the dude, like, yo, like, I just sent him pictures, you know, and the next bag was a lot better, you know, because solventless water hash, like, you can't hide that shit in, in there. It comes out. So, I always tell people that. Yeah. You hash can't. never lies. The hash never lies. Even, like, you take something nasty and make hash out of it, it's, it's not going to be good, good, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I got a couple questions in here now real quick. Paperback Supreme asked a while ago, he said, I see you work primarily with cured material. Do you think that causes darker hash or is that primarily caused by contaminants? Uh, I think it does cause darker hash because, I mean, simply as looking at the trichome, as it's cured more, it gets ambered right, it starts to get darker, and then your hash is going to be just like that because that's what you're collecting the heads. So, uh, yeah, cured material, you will get darker hash, but I think you'll get more effects, different effects that you would get from fresh frozen because you have more the uh, aged oil and whatnot. Um, I just saw Beer Bros post something about CBN. My last employer talked a lot about CBN because he did a lot of traditional hash, like uh, you know, he's European, so he did a lot of darker hash. They love that darker hash because you get that CBN and like kind of puts you to sleep kind of thing. So cure material you probably get darker hash don't be scared from that because it's a different effect different experience 
and enjoy both, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's very good points. I, I think my two cents on that would be people need to differentiate between dried and cured. Dried and cured are not the same thing. And when people say it's cured, like people that actually know what they're saying, like green thumb, deal, when they say it's cured, it's not just like freshly dried. Like that shit's probably a couple months cured. You know, I know green thumb runs his shit for a while. And um, that's a big difference. So with cured material, you will get that darker color from the, the degradation, you know, the trichomes and all that shit that goes on and um, the oxidation. But with freshly dried material, you can still get a very light color. Um, it's just really about the cultivar, too, and how long you take it, right? Um, I know there's a lot of cultivars that I've come across that, especially if they're grown outdoors in the sun, it doesn't matter. They're just going to be darker than their indoor counterpart, you know? So a lot of stuff to consider when it comes to color, but I definitely would not be afraid of color. Some of the best meds I have are darker in color. Something I want to I'll add to with the cured dry material for the hash maker's sake, um, you have to work really hard to get all of it out. And I would just recommend leaving it cured and dried as flour, you know, and let's uh, give me the dry material or the fresh frozen material to make hash with yeah cured material is like really dense and it, you can't break it apart easy yeah you can you, you, you can really beat the fuck out of it and get it super cold you know but you have to sometimes to get the full get all of it out you know and then you gotta yeah. sell it and then who's gonna, who wants to buy the darker hash that you worked like two times as hard <laughs> to get. exactly but you exactly. had to to get anything out of it exactly yeah. Man, the runaround. Not a lot of people know about that dance as a hash man. Yeah. That's a that's a dance right there. Luckily, I don't I don't fucking whoops. Uh, uh, I get cussed. <laughs> I don't mess with like numbers that much, man, which kind of is my downfall too. I'm starting to do that more. Like uh record the yields and, and whatnot. So Nikki asked, "What kind of washer deal grows use?" <clears throat> hey, holla! Where's your Pele Polaire at, bro? We need to get your logo and fucking wrap you up, dude. <laughs> this is my logo right here. This is like, a, you know, everyone wants to start a brand. They think of something. It's just a stupid like igloo, you know. What you see on my Instagram. Yeah, but, but people know you by that. You need yeah, to put that on a Pele. Bro, yeah. what size is what size is that? A twenty? That's a twenty. Yeah. All right. Bet. I need to get. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't yeah. even trip. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So Sandman so, brought up a cool point. He said that years back he used a vacuum chamber from the BHO setup to help dry the hash quicker, but the poor man's freeze dryer is using dry ice and a vacuum chamber. Absolutely, man. I don't know Fire. how many of you guys follow <clears throat> my boy John Osterman on Instagram. The guy is a mad genius, and he built his own freeze dryer doing exactly that. He literally Crazy. built his own freeze dryer using dry ice. He built a vacuum chamber like on his own. He didn't use like an actual already pre-made one. He built one. It was crazy. A fucker actually tested it like so many times and got it right. I don't know how he had the patience, but... Mini fridge versus beer fridge. That's a good um, good note. So the beer fridge has the ability to set the temp and humidity where the mini fridge does it. Excellent point. I didn't think about that. Yeah. yeah I think this uh, this humidity gets down pretty low because this one is actually like, a, like someone said to point out it's a beer like chiller or a beer froster. It gets pretty low. Like right here, I threw that uh, temp in there. Let's see what it's reading now because it says 30. On, on the unit, but oh yeah, 22, it's 38, so it's still dropping. So yeah, 22% humidity in there right now. Mm -hmm. So somebody said that a lot of people on Instagram are chasing that light color and pulling plants early to get that light hash. And I would say that I agree with that with a lot of the commercial hashers and that are processing commercial levels of material. And, you know, that's because it's very difficult to pull down 
large quantities, you know, right at the perfect moment. A lot of times you do have to start a little bit early to get majority of the crop pulled down at right at the peak time. But also, you know, it's just they're lazy too. And um, there's no real excuse for that. But yeah, like Sandman said, you can achieve light hash by pulling it at the proper time. It's more so about your drying technique and how you process it after that. You look like you're getting ready for another dab. I'll, I'll fucking join you on that one. Let's go. Dude, I'm using this uh, tweaker dabber. <laughs> Bro, I got one. I got one too. What's up? <laughs> you always got you always have to have the meth the meth pipe standby. That's funny. Now I got one of the uh, the seven ten coil uh, e nails, man. Fire! But I left my coil for my de my e nail is at my uh, my buddy's house. This poor guy blew out his foot. Oh man! So something I want to bring up, there's a lot of people talking about the color back and forth, right? And there's so many variables that go into the color of the hash. It's really not even fair to judge it based off the color alone, like somebody said. But at the same time, um, in a lot of the, the market now, where especially where it's legal, you don't get to open the package and smell it. You damn sure don't get to try it first, you know? So a lot of the legal market, which a lot of the huge operators of the traditional market went legal when they had the chance early on, they influenced a lot of people by making that light colored hash, you know, and a lot of people misunderstood and thought, oh, damn, that shit is super light. It must be harvested early. It must be premature just because they didn't understand the tech behind it. And then that just you know, per perpetuated and exacerbated the, the myth that everything has to be pulled down early to be that color. And people just started pulling shit down early, you know, but that's not necessarily the case. You just have to know what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I just watched, uh, I was watching um, Future Canvas Project, his uh, YouTube video with Puffin. Mm -hmm. And that guy gets pretty light color hash and he does that full spectrum, you know. So it's pretty impressive. And not to take it, not to take away from Puffin, but all glory to the grower right there, pretty much, man. Like they're doing something right. I, I believe he goes in too and actually extracts it and actually uh, processes it off the plant. So that's also key. That's something that I don't have control of because my growers grow for flower. So I get what I get, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. I just talked about him the other day and said all of that shit, like the fact that he goes to the grow to chop it down himself to make sure it's done right, because too many, <clears throat> too many extractors, in my opinion, rely on the growers to start the extraction process, which really begins at harvest or right before, you know, so that's when the extractor should be getting involved. <clears throat> I would even go further, man. Like, it starts like how you where you started from, you know, from seed. Like, a lot of growers spray shit on their plants, you know, and you can't control it, you know. But growing yeah. for hash or growing for resin, you don't really want to damage the trichomes or anything like that. I think. Would you think water is okay? Obviously, you know, you can't really. Water is fine to get on the plants, but spraying. Foyer spraying is that okay? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't. I don't grow right now for <clears throat> myself yet, but I always think about that. A lot of good stuff in the chat. Chat's fast. So, uh, what about oxidation causing rosin discoloring? Like what Bird said, bird, bird extracts. Uh, oh yeah, like whipping it. I agree with that. I believe that. You don't really want to whip it too much and introduce too much oxygen. Maybe just like more mashing. Not Why not? To, to introduce oxygen, because oxygen equals oxidization, which is discoloring, maybe you get it darker. I'm going to call bullshit on that. And that's why I'm the unpopular opinion hasher. That's okay. I'll disagree with them because look at my single source, full spectrum 
work. All of it. Your it runs. always comes out runs. I pull it on day 58. Most people pull it on day 55. My G6 and my Frost Factory and the other shit I pulled down before that, all taken full term, dried, and full spectrum. And it comes out cleaner and a lighter color than most people's, you know, whatever you name it. You know, and I whip my shit. I don't think it has to do with oxidation itself. I think it has to do with the same thing as like what happens on the plates. It's not the condition that degrades it. It's the time exposed to that condition. So if you're whipping it, you know what I'm saying? Like, look at Taffy Tech. People think that you Taffy Tech, right, um, to like get, get oxygen out or some shit. No, Taffy Tech is to put oxygen in, right? right. And yeah. what does it do? Taffy Tech turns rosin lighter. Lighter. <clears throat> so yeah. I think that whole oxidation causing, uh, causing rosin discoloring, I think it's true, but only under certain conditions. And if it's left too long under those conditions. Time. You said time. That's like the, that's the most important thing. How long you're exposing it for. For sure. I, I don't think whipping has shit to do with discoloration. It has everything to do with how you store your rosin after that. If you're storing your rosin with a, you know, a fuck ton of heat around it, humidity around it, if you're constantly opening it and you're not storing it in a dark, cold place, yeah, your shit's going to degrade, you know, whether you whipped it or not. Just smoke it. Fuck storing it. <laughs> I would rather err on the side of caution, whipping my my rosin and exposing as much of it as I can to the air so that any hidden moisture can come out of it, rather than leaving parts of the rosin that might still have moisture in it trapped. You know what I'm saying? If you whip it all up, you expose all of it, you have a greater chance of making sure that that moisture does come out, in my opinion. And I like you said it before once, like mixing it together so that there's an even dab, you know, everyone get, it's all an even dab, you know? Exactly. Not one dab is more than the other as far as flavor or effects. Hold on, let me see what this guy said. Uh, any dabbers go on to check out the divine? Nope, 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 haven't seen that. The quicker a hash darkens, the better it is, I always heard. I think that's some stoner shit. Uh oh, deals is gone. Early train is indoor greed. That's right. I wish people judged cannabis extracts and products on effort, not color. I'm too old. Yeah. So one of the things that, you know, I want to talk about, I've talked about this before is people are quick to judge the hash maker or the processor based on certain qualities that more or less could be contributed more so to the grower um, than the hasher. Because as a hasher who has their technique dialed in, if you see a hasher who's consistently producing fire with his own meds, with other people's shit, and then all of a sudden somebody's stuff doesn't come out that great, but they wanna blame the hasher, right? You have to look at what's going on because a lot of times shit's not within our control. Flavor profile, if we get a bag of material that is green, they trap that fresh hay smell in there, we cannot magic that shit away. It, the freeze dryer does not remove that, right? No process we have is going to remove that. So, hold on, let me get deal in here. So there's there's no way to to fix certain things like that. Same thing if they over over uh, fertilize. There's that over fertilized taste. If it's you know high nitrogen or whatever. If it was dried improperly, it just has that nasty over dried taste. There's a lot of things that are outside of the hasher's control, and um, you know there are certain things that you can you know put on the grower and certain things you can put on the hasher. So learning what those different qualities are is important. And I think a lot of seasoned dabbers 
can kind of tell. Why is my hat so crooked right now? Under the camera? I'm just high shit. Anyways. <laughs> um, you know, things like how does the how does the rosin hold its consistency? How wet can the, the hasher make it? I can take some of the non terpiest material and do some post-processing to it to help that shit stay more wet and enjoyable so it's not like shattered. There's certain certain things, right? But that, even that is only controllable within a small amount, right? Because the terpene content, the THC content had a lot to do with the consistency and whatnot. But there's certain things that are within the hasher's control and there's certain things that aren't. So when it comes to competitions and cups and all, I don't even really fuck around with them too much because a lot of shit is just influenced by hype. What's gonna win, fresh frozen or dry? A lot of times it's fresh frozen, even though it tastes green, you know? And that's part of the, anyways, I'm not even gonna go there. Anyways, let me get on some more questions here. Yeah, there needs to be a, a better set of standards to critique hash rosin by, I believe. Um, so, really, really good questions here, hold on. So water iffy, I don't spray my buds with anything. Okay, so I don't spray anything on the plants once they've started flower and once they develop bud sites. Up until then, the only things that I use is a foliar application of like essential oils and isopropyl alcohol, Lost Coast Plant Therapy, or I'll make my own blend. Um, I'll do sometimes um, the Power SI, Athena AG stack, and IPM combo, like towards the end of edge, once a week. Um, but that's it. Other than that, I don't hit them with anything. Nothing at all. Um, and once, like I said, once they have bud sites, I stop completely, and they don't get anything. Every once in a while, I'll throw some cow mag in the mix, too, if they're showing they, they need it. But that's it. That is it. Buds themselves don't get sprayed at all, ever. Medicated brought up a good question. How do you personally cope with the rampant elitism in the community slash industry? Thanks for your time. So to be honest with you on that, I just keep my head down and stay in my lane. That's always been my thing is I don't care what Tom, Dick, Harry, or Karen is fucking doing. I don't care how many likes they get on Instagram, how many followers they have, or what they have to say about anything. I care about what I personally have experienced through trial and error, right? And I don't care about going against the grain. That's why this whole fresh frozen hype fuckboy shit it just blows my mind. I'll put my dry material up against fresh frozen any day of the week, and it's going to be better. I guarantee it. I'll, I'll bet my rig on it, okay? That, that's how confident I am in it, right? Fucking green-ass fresh frozen shit blows my mind. So I just stay in my lane, and I learn through trial and error, and I keep my opinions to myself and those who want to hear my opinion. I don't share my opinion openly with people, um, especially on confrontational things, unless I'm just having a bad day and I don't really give a fuck and I feel like pissing people off or causing a stir. But really, I just try and stay in my lane and I don't, I don't care, I just don't care. If you spend your time taking energy out of your day and putting it into caring about somebody else's ego problem, you're just, you're letting them suck you in. So I try to avoid that. Social media, if I start following somebody because they have good content or their, their shit is educational or whatever, you know, but then I see that they're ego, you know, egotistical and shit, I just kind of like mute them. That way when I do want to use their information or learn from them, I can, but I'm not forced to see their fucking small dick syndrome, you know?
I don't know where Deals is. We'll see what happens. Let me see if he comes back. <clears throat> so I don't know. Or, I don't know. He's out of here, I guess. I don't know if he's coming in or what, but um, yeah, that, that's how I deal with it, man. Just try to tunnel vision. Tunnel vision on your grind and your progression, and don't worry about everybody else. Take what you can from who you can and apply it to your craft to make yourself better and negate the boy the bullshit as best you can. <clears throat> so let's say, let me go back up here. I missed some, some comments. It says, there we are. I found that rosin is tricky and very strained terpene specific. It has to do with structuring. I found when Ross starts buffering, it's a peak turf per, turf profile usually and starts losing its magic from that point on. Starts buttering. Uh, yeah. So if I'm not mistaken, that term is called nucleation. I don't quite fully understand it because my shit don't butter up like that anymore. But um, it does have to do with oxygen and being exposed because it only happens in a shitty jar. If you're using clear jars, um, that's a shitty jar. I'm sorry to hurt your feelings. I don't care who's using clear jars. If you're using a clear jar, it's a shitty jar. And if you're using the old Amazon, like one gram jars or whatever, those are really shitty jars. They don't seal well. Um, you need to be having a cushioned lid seal that like really seals it and preferably a dark jar that doesn't let light in and your shit won't butter up and get all fucking bam. Well, Welcome back. Sorry about that, dude. It's all good, bro. Hey, it's it's 1153. I think you, you told me you had some shit going on, so I don't want you to forget. Yeah, no, like, got like maybe another 15, 20 minutes, but. Okay, cool. So real quick, let me finish going through these. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. How do you make melt melt? And we might get there. <laughs> All right, who has any question specifically for Deal? Because, you know, his time is valuable. Let's make sure that we utilize him while we have him. So if you have questions for him, please drop your questions in the comments and make sure you uh, get our attention so that we can address it. Again, freeze dry tech without a freeze dryer, <laughs> right? Pressing from that hash. We didn't even talk about his pressing at all, really. You know, nobody brought up his, his pressing of the hash. So maybe we should talk about that. Temperatures, times, are you a fan of the low and slow, the hot and fast? You doing the jar tech now? Or are you still scraping parchment? What's going on with you? <laughs> uh, man, I'm still trying everything, really, you know. My go-to, I guess, kind of is, uh, I don't have a really go-to. Just trying it all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely not a fan of pressing too hot because uh, I uh, if it doesn't What's go too hot. Okay, yeah, good question. Too hot. Um, anything over 190, maybe? Whoa, too hot. boy! You need yeah. to come on over. You need to come on over to my house and when I press, and I'm gonna show. I'm gonna blow your fucking mind, son. I'm gonna press some shit at like fucking 205, maybe oh, some yeah. fucking 210s. 
I just pressed. I was just pressing at two ten uh, just yesterday, though. So you know, not, not everything comes out that. good at that temp, though. Yeah, it's uh, you know that's the thing. Like I don't have it dialed in. You know, I, I'm still just kind of playing with it. I, my go to like middle was like one eighty. You know, and see how it goes. And then I do a first press, and I look at the bag, and I'm like, oh no, nah, it needs to go more. And I'll go hotter and get so much more from it, and it won't affect the color or the quality, you know? Um, right. I did find that, like, at higher temps, I think, again, maybe it's still just uh, depending on the hash, too. But, like, when it gets too cold, it kind of shatters a little bit if I'm, not too, if I'm not quick enough to get it. And I find that lower temps and, uh, doesn't do it that much, kind of, like, butters more. But not all, it all kind of, like... It, it really, yeah, it's hard to put it all into summary because everything is so different. I totally get where you're coming from. Yeah. So what made you determine that 180 was going to be your low point? Like, what's the lowest you pressed? 160. Okay. And what was your experience with that? Uh, it came out pretty – uh, yield was the only thing I didn't like about it. Not, did it yield enough? So I pressed it like, like at 180. I got more out of it. You know, I find a, a higher temp, you get more yield faster, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. The flow it, starts a little bit faster. I think it's really all material dependent when it comes to pressing, like how the quality of the material, you know? Right. But like, I'm still learning, man. I'm still growing and learning. So like my pressing is kind of everywhere a little bit. Yeah. I play with it. I don't, I'm not really – sometimes I do the – just like if I want to do it fast, I'll do like kind of direct flow. Sometimes I like to pr have it roll off both sides of the plates, you know? Yeah. Um, but I'm still playing with it, to be honest. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, you know, depending on the style of press, the temperature, duration, everything that you're going for, the, the way that you fold the parchment should change because – if you're going to be going for a low and slow, the last thing you want to do is set up the parchment for directional flow and force the hash out one way because it's going to degrade a lot of the hash. You really want to make sure all sides are open to flow. So it's a good point. Um, I would say my lowest has been about 155, and that was on some like freshly harvested and dried single source, you know, shit that was just like you touch it and it starts to melt. So I knew that low temperature it would be good, you know. Usually, if I'm packing the bag of hash into the you know the press bag, and I you know I double bag it, if I have it in my hands and it starts to shape to my hands, it gets that concave pillow shape. That shit's gonna fucking press out at a low temp. But if it can you know hold its shape pretty well and doesn't get you know really like melty in my hand, then I'm gonna go in at a slightly higher temp. Just because I can tell, you know, it's going to need that higher temp to start flowing. But, um, yeah, I would agree with you. The the yield slash quality scale is one that's tricky, and it's different it, for every single batch that you press. So yeah. consistency is key. Like, uh, who said that here? Sandman, right? Consistency. You have to have it. You dial that in. So, you mean, you explain that in so, so well, bro. Like... When you're when you're putting the hash in the bag, that's when you really kind of like make, decide if you're gonna press it like at a higher temp or lower temp. Yeah, mm -hmm. I try to always start out with doing like if I pack all my bags, right? I have all my hash sifted. I'm packing my bags. I get to the last bag and it's like maybe a quarter or a third of what the other ones are. I use that as my test press for the rest of those full spectrum presses. And then I'll use my like either my 25 to my 45 or my 160 to my 190 as a, the initial test press for the whole batch, depending on which one looks best. Whichever one looks best is going to behave more like the full spectrum, you know, goodness. So I pick the best one and I test press those. And then, you know, I can dial it in. Usually I'll start at like 175 now for most material and based on that if the yield is good and the quality is good i really won't fuck with it you know i may even go down if the yield is good and it looks like i can go down and still get good flow but um usually i end up 
anywhere, if I'm going to be on the low side, right, low and slow or hot and fast, low and slow for me is between 155 and 175. Okay. And hot, hot and fast for me is 200 to 225. Everything in between there is like the doo doo zone for me. <laughs> the the, the doo doo zone. It's like the, the time it takes to start flowing versus the time it takes to get off the plates and the amount of time it takes to start degrading. It just all becomes a cluster fuck in that zone. So I stay out of that zone completely, you know, because the worst thing that you can have happen is you're pressing a couple hundred grams of hash. And you fuck up on like a good 50 to 100 grams in that doo doo zone. <laughs> you don't want to do that. It's so a I avoid it. Though, right? Yeah. One, like above, like I'll maybe push it to 180. If at 175, it looks like, damn, the color's bomb and I can increase it and get a little more flow. Maybe I'll go to 180, but I never go to 185 ever. I, and I'll skip straight to 200. Because everything in between there is just like, why? Why even fuck with it? It's like it's like saving up for a car and you start with a Honda. Why Why fuck around with all the in-between shit? Just save up and go straight to the, the bomb diggity. Don't, don't upgrade and go to the middle grade. You know, just go sh- skip over that. Don't stop in the doo-doo zone. You that know? is hilarious, man. So basically, according to you, I play in the doo zone a lot. <laughs> I mean, you 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 pull fucking fire product out, but there's no real way because I don't see any consistent material being provided to you. So exactly. unless we can get a farmer that can provide you with consistent material, A, there's no way for you to really hone in you know, that material and B, you know, play around with it and manipulate it how you want. Because, you know, you're experienced and I've seen you manipulate the fuck out of some hash and turn it from like, what looks like doo-doo into gold, you know? Let's talk about that. Post-processing manipulation. What are your techniques? Ah, now my go-to is pretty simple, man. Like, well, just recently, the last one I just did, I said it on my, uh, which is, this is risky. I put it on my freaking uh, monitor, you know, my freaking cable monitor. <laughs> like, it's hot, you know? But I did it for, like, like five minutes at first. I went and checked it out. I'm like, ooh, it's too hot. So I put, like, a like a towel kind of between it, you know? I'm like, all right, that's better. Mm-hmm. But uh, sometimes just letting, letting it do its own thing, you know? Letting it settle in the jar. It might take a few days, sometimes shorter. Um, mm-hmm. I don't like forcing it, you know? I tried forcing it before. And in the whole oven tech, and I made like the first try I did it, I made like really good, consistent. Uh, it was dosy dough, man. And I think it was a strain dependent on this part because I put it in the oven and I might have like decarved it almost or something like that, but it was <laughs> super turpy, it tasted good. You could have put that to a cart, probably, you know. But then when I tried it again, I just totally fucked it up. So I'm like, nah, I don't want to force shit, you know. So letting yeah. it just keep it in the jar and do its thing. Uh, letting it settle, I like that the best, to be honest. Like, naturally, you know? Yeah, I, I have to agree with you there. I experimented with a few things, and all, ultimately, my opinion on people separating all of this shit to do fancy stuff with it, at the end of the day, what are they doing? They're combining it back together and dabbing it. So, right. It's fun, so, though, right? <laughs> I guess. So why? Why not homogenize the dab and make it so that every dab as is just as good as the first one, right? Why do you want to have these stupid ratios to fuck around with the terps versus, like, come on, man, like, give me the whole shebang every time. I don't want, like, a little head and then a little booty and then, like, a little hand job. Like, I want the whole show every time. <laughs> You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, it, it takes a long time to do that shit too, though, man. It's a yeah. It takes yeah. a long time, bro. And ultimately, I think, like you said, you let it sit, you know, for a few days and cure if it needs to be cured. What, what's your opinion on people curing? I'll ask before I talk. What's your opinion on people? 
curing their rosin after they press it? And what's the techniques that you've seen people using? Uh, I mean, my first, what comes to mind is like, what's, what is curing rosin? Like, are you leaving it out open air? Or are you doing the whole jar tag thing, you know? I don't know. I really don't know what curing rosin really is. <sighs> I just, I don't. That's what we talk about all the time, bro, on my channel is, I ask people, can you cure rosin like this? No, you cannot cure shit with the lid on. Why not? Because no moisture can escape. And what is curing? It's releasing the moisture slowly over time so that you have a stable product, right? You're not curing anything if the moisture is not going anywhere. So to me, a lot of people in hashers are mostly to blame for this. They're using the incorrect terminology to explain some hyped up fuckboy shit. You're not going to put rosin in a jar with the lid on, put it in a fridge and cold cure anything, you know? So I teach people, you put a micron screen over your jar with a rubber band, and put it in a clean, cold, dark environment for a couple of days and agitate it every couple of days if needed until your rosin no longer sizzles or cracks on the banger when you dab it. And you, unless your rosin is sizzling or crackling on the banger when you dab it, you don't need to cure anything. There's no excess moisture there to, to ruin the product. You know, it's not sizzling or cracking. You're good. So it just blows my mind that so many, you know, um, big name hashers throw the terminology around so loosely and misconstrue the true meaning of those terms, you know, and maybe it's more so hashers that don't have an experience growing and don't know the difference between drying and curing. You know, I don't, I don't know where that issue comes from, but it's fucking annoying. I have no clue, but like, as I see the rosin industry like developed, I'm like, man, like whoever says something first, it's going to be that, you know, and it, it's weird. Like, so like Sandman are, says, three day cold cure, room temp though, locked lid, no light. Like, I agree with everything except for the locked lid because you want the excess moisture, if there is any, to evaporate before you close the lid on it. Otherwise, you're trapping moisture in there. Trapped moisture inside of rosin leads to early um, expiration. So, and rosin does expire, especially when you're leaving it at room temps above like 60 degrees. So, you know, I, I have proof of that. I left a jar out on purpose to prove it because I got tired of hashers making um, edibles out of dirty rosin and getting away with it. So I wanted to prove a point and I don't know where that jar went, but I'm going to find it and I'll show you guys. Rosin does go bad. Oh yeah. I, I, I have, I think I have a few jars that are expired. You know? Definitely. I've seen jars that are really good quality go bad because improper use of storing. I think I've already threw it out. Fuck. Boy, I might have already thrown it out yesterday when I was cleaning up. Anyways, but yeah, that's that's my thing with the, the curing is too many people think curing is just throwing the lid on it and keeping it in a cold room or something, and that's not the case, you know. Harry W said uh, a one-way check valve for you know on the jar. Like a little valve to release. That'd be kind of cool. That you would be. Right, sorry. I feel like, why would I have thrown that out? I intentionally was keeping it. Unless I just didn't realize what I was doing. I probably put it somewhere and didn't realize it. Anyways, I'll find it later. I'll post pictures of it. <laughs> Speaker doubts it. So what happens when it expires? Fuck, now you asked that question and I really want to show you. So when rosin starts to expire, it starts to become bitter because the, the small amounts of fat, lipids, uh, trace amounts of plant matter, trichome husk, etc., cetera, um, all start to decompose, especially if they have any um, moisture in there. 
right? Um, especially if they're at room temperature, um, if they're oxidizing. Um, so, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna degrade really quick and then it's gonna grow mold, especially if there's moisture in there, right? Yeah, terpenes go rancid, right? Yeah, it's, you gotta sure. freeze your shit, really. Like, if you have a jar of rosin that's bigger than what you can consume in two to three days, take out two to three days, maybe four days worth of material or dabs, I mean, put it in a separate jar and then put the rest in a sealed container in the freezer. You know what I'm saying? And then let it come back to room temperature before you open it up every time and then replenish your small jar as needed. That way you can, you know, ensure that your main supply never goes back. And it's not still okay to consume usually. Um, typically it'll start to discolor, maybe even look greenish, start to grow mold, um, just generally smell bad. Like if you have like a natural fruit juice, right? That has natural terpenes in it. Think about when it starts to expire, it starts to ferment, get bitter and rancid smelling. That's the same exact thing that happens with a jar of rosin once it starts to go bad. And it only takes about two to three weeks for it to start happening at room temperature, which most people store their terps at. So, you know, refrigerator, at least freezer is the best. Facts. These jars are proof, too. For sure. That's crazy. They have a green tinge starting on them? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't think they're growing mold, you know, but they definitely lost their lost their terps, you know? Mm -hmm. They still smell good. Damn, I wish I had that jar right here. But, yeah, so basically, smoke it fast and get more. <laughs> yeah, I mean, or just keep it Keep it in a sealed area. Let me look one more time. Oh. Ah, I found it. Here it is. Look, check this out. I don't know how well you guys are going to be able to see this. So see the bottom? Where's my camera? Camera uh, there. Uh, there. Yeah, there Ah, yeah. It's like green. It's, it kind of looks slimy almost, too. Yeah, that wow. is rosin going bad. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> and see the, uh, this, I don't even think I need that light. There's like a chunk up here at the, oh, there's the camera dead center right there. Yeah. That chunk in the center, you can see it. It's like gross and like hardened off. It's just this shit has been sitting out for about 30 days now. Oh, damn. And, and uh, it's been in here where the temperature fluctuates between 50 degrees to 80 degrees. And, um, you know, that's. But it's been sealed, you know, and it was smokable before I stored it. I was smoking out of this. You know, it was good at one point when it was fresh. But. When you leave it out, that's what happens. And a lot of people don't realize that shit. And this goes into your fucking edibles that you're getting from whoever the fuck gives you your hash rosin edibles. Because nine times out of ten, they don't have enough of the, the edibles um, grade rosin from one run to make edibles. So they have to save it up over time. And as they're saving it up and adding and adding and adding... Guess what's happening in between every layer? That. And that's going into your fucking edibles. <laughs> Damn. Hey, brother. Thank you for uh, inviting me, homie. I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Um, everybody, fucking big up to Deal Grows for coming on stream, dropping his tech with us. We're going to save this stream. This is one for the books for sure. And cool. uh, deal, man. I'll catch you later. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it, dude. Yes, this, sir, man. This is something really cool. This guy, oh, this, yeah, guy awesome. this guy, this guy is awesome, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool, man. I'll catch you later, bro. All right, peace. All right. Sweet, man. So, deal grows super dope. 
Uh, let me know if you guys have any last minute questions before I go ahead and hop off the stream. I'm going to go ahead and keep it short. I want to keep it on topic because we're going to save this stream. Um, keep it specifically for this conversation. Um, and, you know, I'll go live later for regular garden stuff. But any last minute questions, please let me know. Yeah, Chris, man, this is what happens a lot of times. Transparency is big to me, and a lot of rosin makers will take stuff like this. They'll save it up over time and use it for edibles. And unfortunately, if it's not stored properly, this is what can happen. But I don't think that a lot of hash makers themselves even pay attention to it. So it's something that I wanted to personally document and show for myself. El Chapo, what up, bro? Thoughts on drying hash in a mason jar without a lid and a coffee filter? Um, yeah, I wouldn't use a coffee filter, though. I would use like a nylon micron screen, maybe 15 or 25 micron with a rubber band around it. Arjun, go back and watch the stream for the for uh, from the beginning, and you'll get all the answers you need, brother. Weed House, it was a privilege, man. Thank you guys for tuning in, and um, I will catch you guys later. Have a good evening.